the shale revolution has turned the energy world upside down. Finally, the United States may be nearing the long-time goal of every president since Richard Nixon, becoming energy independent. Net exporter of energy. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, the U.S. will become a net energy exporter by 2020. What's gone on the last few years has been nothing short of a miracle. Western Pennsylvania, the new Saudi Arabia of the United States. But it's not at no cost. Because you own the mineral rights, you essentially get very well paid to take that environmental and personal risk. While many have benefited, there's hope where you know, for a long time there, there, there wasn't. Some say they have lost a great deal. I've been hospitalized for drinking this water. I took one sip, my kidneys fell, my spleen fell, and was left with a two millimeter ulcer in my duodenum and spent four days in the hospital. With so much at stake in the fight for energy independence and protecting our environment, should the U.S. ban fracking? In what became known as the Shell Revolution, hydraulic fracturing became wildly used across the U.S. Both natural gas and oil can be extracted using this process. About half the natural gas in the United States comes out of the same wells uh, that produce crude oil. So in other words, you produce crude oil and natural gas comes along with it. As of 2017, the U.S. Energy Information Administration estimated there were about 2,459 trillion cubic feet of dry natural gas in the U.S., Assuming the rate of production stays the same, that means the U.S. has enough dry natural gas to last about 80 years. The Marcellus Shale holds the largest natural gas reserve in North America. In 2018, 6.2 trillion cubic feet of gas was produced in Pennsylvania alone. That's nearly a third of total U.S. consumption. What's gone on the last few years has, has been nothing short of a miracle in terms of companies being able to reduce their cost and produce crude gas, NGLs, or whatever it is, far, far below what anybody thought they could do. The real revolution, which was first in natural gas but then moved to oil, was to combine horizontal drilling with fracking. And that then totally revolutionized U.S. oil production. The revolutionary breakthrough combined two existing technologies. First is horizontal drilling, essentially drilling straight down and then turning at an angle to target part of the shale formation. The second is hydraulic fracturing, or fracking. This involves pumping water, sand, and chemicals at high pressure into shale formations to fracture the rock, allowing oil and gas trapped inside to flow. From 2007 to 2018, natural gas production increased by nearly 60%. Prices dropped from almost $9 to $2.5 per BTU. Crude oil production grew from 5 to over 10 million barrels a day, which led to a drop in imports by 40%. That meant big energy savings for the everyday consumer. In October 2019, the Council of Economic Advisers estimated the shale revolution saves American families of four about $2,500 annually. They claim nearly 80% of the total savings comes from a lower price for natural gas. Today, natural gas mining and extraction employs more than 162,000 workers in the U.S. From 2004 to 2018, over 350,000 jobs were created nationwide. And many of those jobs were based in places above the Marcella Shale in states like Pennsylvania. In PA, the first unconventional well was drilled in Washington County in 2004. By 2009, there were 821 active wells. In 2011, 1956. There's a lot of hope in this area because people are doing well. When you can this is Diana Irie Vaughn. She's been the Washington County Commissioner for 24 years and a staunch supporter of the gas industry. We've heard from so many individuals um, who are leaseholders in the industry how this has changed their financial future for generations to come. There have been a number of farmers that have told us that if it had not been for the leases, they probably would have been out of business. With the downturn in the steel industry and the coal industry, there was like this vacuum. And a lot of the people that I went to school with, they have since moved away, but now there's something filling that void. There, there are jobs. There's 
hope where you know, for a long time there, there, there wasn't. This is Richard and Bonnie Moore. They are farmers in Washington County in southwestern Pennsylvania. This farm has been in Bonnie's family since the 1860s. It's 185 acres. Just a mile and a half up the road, Rich has a 90-acre farm that he inherited from his family. In 2005, the oil and gas industry came knocking on the door. Both farms are leased to range resources. Everybody was excited about, oh boy, we're going to have gas wells. And when range came here and drilled the wells, they told us everything that they would do, and they did what they said. It was really exciting for a lot of the people around here that owned their mineral rights. See, we're working smart. Bonnie and Rich didn't feel comfortable sharing how much they've made from their gas leases. But according to documents CNBC has analyzed, it's significant. They've since bought two farms worth nearly $2 million. You have the ability to essentially pay someone for the environmental risk, which is as much about the, the problems under the surface as about on the surface, such as, for example, from all the trucks and all the guys working on the oil, that you don't really want those people around if you have the choice or unless you're paid. And in the U.S., because you own the mineral rights, you essentially get very well paid to take that environmental and personal risk. Brian Lekonich is also a Washington County resident with a gas lease. They sold it as the new Saudi Arabia of the United States, Western Pennsylvania. Your kids aren't going to have to go to the Middle East to fight wars again. For having two boys of, of age now, 18 and 19, it felt wonderful that we could be energy self-sufficient. So when the company came to me with four people in my living room here and said, hey, you're looking at eight to 13 million dollars in the first three years, I said, where do I sign? Would you like to put it on my front porch? Brian's lessee is Chevron. His contract included a $25,000 signing bonus and a royalty payment that was $12,000 at its peak to now between $500 to $800 a month. I used to have a nice few acre orchard here and I used to plant tomatoes, peppers and vegetables here. Every week or so I'd go up onto the pad and talk to them and hang out. I was the cheerleader, you know. I wore my boots and my helmet. Well, that particular day I carried a camera. Accurate date is 121712. 12. And what you could see here is the frack ponds, they pulled the liners out of them and left the polluted material right on, on the ground. They pumped the other one out, pulled the liner, left the wet soil, and they were in a rush to fill this in. But what I found was a trash pump in that pit pumping water out of there onto my own property. This wasn't trucked out. Here's your liners right there on the ground. That's not permitted. That's, that's toxic. They never restored the site, and there was so much water runoff that it came down against my house and fractured the foundation and actually pushed this house about three inches. Brian made these allegations in dozens of complaints he filed with the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, or DEP. I've had six years of water testing already. Still, DEP and Chevron stand firm that the issue with Brian's drinking water is not a consequence of gas drilling on his property. Chevron told CNBC that Brian's water quality is about the same now as before the wells were drilled and that the chemical composition of his water is distinctly different than the water from their operations. It also appears that DEP was aware of Chevron's alleged lack of oversight. According to documents CNBC has reviewed, they issued Chevron at least two violations three days prior to Brian's photos, one for discharge of pollutional material to waters of Commonwealth, and the other for improperly discharging top hole water. Chevron corrected these violations. According to an appraisal ordered by Brian's insurance company, the damage to the house was partly due to the runoff from the drill site. However, Chevron's own report, done by another company, did not find a link. This is a sample from Brian's house and uh, showing that it's... John Stolz is a professor of environmental microbiology at Duquesne University. 
He's an outspoken supporter of renewable energy and ran for Congress in 2017. This is a summary of all his, with the exception of the two samples that, that my group took, uh, it just shows you the, the pre-drill sample and then the DEP water samples. Clearly, as the, as the months go on, you can see that bromide is consistently there. Bromide is one of those things that you, you don't typically expect to find in a freshwater aquifer or a water source, groundwater source. When we ran Brian samples in this analysis, it, it was clear to me at least that uh, they did share some of the characteristics that you see that are characteristic of oil and gas brines. So that's important to me because this is what Brian is talking about, that you know these wells on his property affected his uh, water, source of water. That's a responsibility of our Department of Environmental Protection. When they look at pre-drill testing and testing that's done afterwards, if there's been an alteration in the quality of that water, then replacement is required. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, may it please the court, my name is John Smith. This man is John Smith. He's considered somewhat of a legend in Washington County. He's been before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court three times. The DEP has a limited set of parameters in what they're testing for. So they're not going to the site and asking the company, the drilling company, what did you use, what did you release? They're coming with a preconceived set of parameters that they're testing for. Dog even waited. Brian says his nine-year-old son, Ryan, has struggled with his health since he was three. A toxicology report shows that his asthma, headaches, coughing, tinnitus, and leg pain could be linked to the water contamination. They haven't figured out why he's incontinent. The acute medical therapy is indicated in the exposure. Certainly we agree with more DEP and EPA involvement to address this exposure. Our main recommendation from a toxicological and exposure perspective is to stay away from the exposure source. And in parentheses, the house site, air, and water as much as possible. Now, how do you stay away from your home? <laughs> I'd like to know. Brian, what are you doing about all of this? What can you do about this? The level of documentation that somebody's going to need to, to bring, for instance, a water contamination case, you know, again, should, be, should start with the DEP. If the DEP does its job successfully, then they will provide the necessary documentation. Why the numbers are, in my opinion, relatively low is the way the DEP deals with these issues is that if your water is contaminated, and you can work out a deal with the oil and gas industry, the DEP will not issue a citation or will not issue a notice of violation for that water contamination. Ultimately, I, at this point, I just want to get a buyout and move my son away from here and myself so we can try to get better and have a normal life. What's the amount that you, that you have asked for? We're 100,000 a year for six, six years for the lack of use of my property and 70,000 to fix the house. And what was their reaction when you said seven, 670? They reacted like that was fine. They were gonna take that back and, and give me an answer. When folks see dollar signs behind stuff, they'll try and chase it all day long. I would share with you that our industry is highly compliant, highly focused, and I think in, when it's all said and done with, you'll find that most folks have been vindicated of any wrongdoing. Clearly, the shale revolution's contributions are nuanced. Abolishing the practice of fracking would have protected people like Brian, but also would have barred families like the Moors from profiting off of their mineral rights. Since renewables are not yet able to sustain American energy consumption, banning fracking would take the U.S. off the path to energy independence, and we would also return to importing more energy. Consumers would likely pay a premium for importing oil and natural gas, but would be protected from the potential environmental harm caused by fracking. We're really stuck right here, and we got to see it through. And hopefully it doesn't kill us while we're doing it.
In PA, one state senator proposed a constitutional amendment to ban the procedure, while others proposed adding a tax on the citizens to help build out new infrastructure. The Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office is pursuing a criminal investigation of environmental crimes in Washington County, Pennsylvania, as it relates to the oil and gas industry. In an email to CNBC, the AG's office did not confirm and declined to comment. On the national level, in 2019, the Trump administration announced plans to allow fracking on over a million additional acres of public and private lands in California. Presidential candidates Senators Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders have both publicly called for a nationwide ban on fracking. However, former Vice President Joe Biden has said he would not ban fracking and does not oppose new drilling on federal lands. In a CNN town hall on climate change, Biden said he would examine existing fracking sites to see if they are safe, but that states have control of their lands. We could pass national legislation, but I don't think we'd get it done. The development of fracking has changed the debate on energy in the U.S. forever. While some have profited significantly, others have faced incredible hardships. You know what Lincoln said, you know, you can, you can please some of the people some of the time, but you can't please all of them all the time.